Good evening and a very warm welcome to Wellington Cathedral of St Paul on this the feast day of Christ the King where God takes up our humanity into heaven and draws us closer through the mysteries of his grace. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all people such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel, and in silence remember God's presence with us now. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
The first lesson is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, beginning at the first verse. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I will lead the blind by the road they do not know. By paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. Here ends the first lesson. I invite you to stand as we sing our office hymn number 589, The King of Love My Shepherd Is.
The second lesson is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, Is this he? Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
In the name of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Giver of life. Amen. Uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, this sermon that I'm going to preach this evening is the second of a series of three uh, which are all about seeing or vision and its opposite, blindness. In the first of the sermons, which was last week, we heard God asking the prophet Jeremiah, what do you see? And next Sunday, we move to the book of Revelation, um, the revelation of a new heaven and a new earth, and that vision. Today, this evening, we focus on blindness, or more exactly, how a blind man came to see. And for us to get this now, uh, just reflect for a moment uh, what it would mean uh, for you to go blind. And apologies if there are any people in the cathedral at the moment who are in fact blind. And I invite you just to shut your eyes for a moment and imagine what it was like if you go around all the time with your eyes shut. You can't see the faces around you or the sea or the sky or the trees or anything at all. You can't tell whether the lights are on or off in the space where you're sitting or who the other people are if some of them are not talking. And for me, I don't know about for you, uh, this is worse than being deaf. In our reading, which we've heard from John 9, the man in question had been blind from birth. He'd never seen anything except the vague, swirling colors you see if you close your eyes. But basically his was a world of darkness. Was this his life sentence, as it is for many people who are born blind? He was sitting by the road, a pitiable figure, probably begging for his food. It so happens, though, that Jesus and his disciples are passing by. They start discussing, how come this man was born blind? The conventional wisdom was that blindness was caused by sin, either by in the person concerned or their parents. Is that how it is? The disciples ask Jesus. In his reply, Jesus rejects this explanation and goes on to say something much more positive. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, says Jesus. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. In other words, God is not so cruel as deliberately to give people a life sentence of being a cripple or blind from the moment of their birth. Rather, God is the God of life. The source of the desire of the blind person to see with all the life possibilities that would open up for him. 
We can imagine the blind person having this desire. In this case, God is always particular. His desire to see the people passing by, or we can imagine his own family, who he's never actually seen. But then as the text continues, something wonderful happens. Somebody who is called the light of the world is passing by. And this picks up Jesus' self-description in the previous chapter of John's Gospel. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. But now this claim to be the light of the world is put to test, put to the test. Here is a blind man who literally walks in darkness. He walks, he eats, he talks, he touches in darkness, in blindness. The wonder that follows is, is told in terms that people of the time would understand. Jesus anoints the man's eyes with mud, moistened with his own spittle. He orders the man to wash it off in the pool of Siloam. He does so and comes back able to see. But these details apart, uh, the guts of this story is of a man encountering Jesus, who is the light of the world. But immediately, the man encounters a barrage of skepticism from his neighbors as he relates how he came to be healed. How come you can see? Or perhaps it was a case of mistaken identity. But the formerly blind man keeps doggedly repeating, whereas I was blind, now I see. Whereas I was blind, now I see. And he keeps pointing to the man, Jesus, who did it. And this invites us to focus on the man, Jesus, in whose presence uh, the lame walk, the blind see, and lepers are cleansed. And here are three insights that may tell us more who Jesus is in this text, or fill out our particular picture of Jesus so that it becomes operational in this deeply healing way. First of all, Jesus took to heart the things he read in the Bible. Uh, he was an avid reader of our First Testament, for him the Bible, and he knew all the Psalms off by heart. In Isaiah 35, he would have read and meditated on the words, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. This is Isaiah's prophecy. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. But the difference is that Jesus not only took this to heart, these great texts of the scriptures that he inherited, he also acted them out. It was, if you like, his script. And second, as a way of throwing light on this, we might recall the hymn Amazing Grace. And this was 
as you probably know, written by a, a sea captain called John Newton, who actually was a slave trader. Uh, he sailed his boat to West Africa, where he collected black Africans, uh, brought back to Liverpool, a city, as the theologian Karl Barth uh, once pointed out, which was built on the skulls of Negroes. In other words, thousands of these poor people either died en route and were pitched off into the sea, or if they died in Liverpool, were shoveled into mass graves. And it, that's why Karl Barth said that the city was built on the skulls of Negroes. But the ones who survived were transported or uh, sold to traders and plantation own owners in America, uh, the so-called New World. But one day, in the middle of his life, and it may have been in mid-ocean, Newton realized that what he was doing was wrong. And he, in effect, turned his boat around and took some of the slaves back to where they'd come from. And this was a turnaround, literally, and a deep conversion of heart, which led him to become a priest and an ally of William Wilberforce in the campaign that was then getting underway to abolish slavery. We can perhaps recall some of the words of the hymn. Unfortunately, I can't sing it to you. Uh, I once was blind, but now I see. And this was the amazing grace. And finally, as a way of throwing another light on our reading, a contemporary story about the restoration of sight by modern medicine. I had a daughter called Kathy, uh, who as a girl, when she was 15, 16, was afflicted with glaucoma, whereby uh, the eyeball starts to swell to the point where if it's not checked in some way, um, it starts to crush the optic nerve and the person goes blind. Her eye started to swell, her left eye, and she began to lose the sight of that eye. We lived in Cambridge in the UK at the time and had the good fortune that at Addenbrooke's Hospital there was a Professor Cairns who had devised the operation to treat glaucoma, basically to bore a microscopic hole in the eyeball to release the buildup of fluid that was threatening to crush the optic nerve. This, I think you'll agree, is modern medicine at its very best. best. Uh, nobody but some wild fundamentalist nutter would nowadays try to treat blindness with a concoction of mud and spit. In that way, Jesus was a man of his time. He didn't know what Professor Cairns knew. But what he did do was to put the whole practice of healing uh, by whatever means firmly on the agenda. And now healing is one of the fundamental impulses of our whole civilization. Healing of every sort, physical, mental, spiritual, in our relationships, of our memories, or whatever. And if we take healing as one of the fundamental paradigms of our culture and our politics and the way we live in Aotearoa, we should reflect that there are whole civilizations and countries where this is not so. 
uh, where everything works through violence or some other way. In that way, we may be engaged in one of the healing professions like medicine or other, but this whole thing about healing that surfaces again and again in the Bible has a fundamental question um, to each one of us. Namely, am I a healing, reconciling person in my family, my work, or wherever? And this is a question that requires um, a combination of realism and humility to answer properly. And we might ask ourselves, do I need healing? And if so, am I into finding the person who can help me? So here's the question that we're left with as church people or as family people or workplace people or whatever we are. Are the places that we inhabit our churches places of healing? Or can they become toxic and destructive? Or are they toxic and destructive? After this service, some of us will meet in the room off to one side here. And that, in effect, will be the topic we have for discussion. What do we mean by healing? And where or to whom uh, would I go if I once decide that I need healing? So I'll leave you with that question and hope some of us can meet after the service to tussle with that issue. Now in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life are these words spoken. On this, the last Sunday of our church's year, as we remember Christ our King and his sacrifice for us, let us turn to him in prayer, seeking his light. We pray for the worldwide church and ask, Lord, that you would grant to your people light to know the will of God and the grace to perform it. Pray for our Bishop Justin, our three Tikanga Church, and all those who minister and serve among us. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to continue to guide, strengthen, and encourage us. Grant us insight that your light may be known in every place of darkness. We pray that the peace of Christ our King may be known throughout the world, breaking down all the barriers that divide nations and draw people together for the common good. We picture in our mind's eye a situation, a region, or a people that need the closer light of Christ this night. We pray that the love of Christ our King may comfort and uphold all who suffer 
Strengthen, Lord, all those as individuals or organisations who work to bring relief. And we pray for ourselves that the glory, majesty and example of Christ our King might fill our hearts and lives with a deeper compassion and open our eyes to see the presence of Christ in all people. Loving God, you have taught us that the power of the heart is greater than the power of wealth and might. Visit us with your light this night, we pray, and hear us as we pray for the fulfilment of your reign, that your kingdom would come here on earth as in heaven. We enfold all of our thoughts and prayers in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we sing hymn number 398, Christ triumphant, ever reigning.